Good evening from the Tiso Velodrome in Grenchen, Switzerland, where the eyes of the sporting world are focused on the most hotly anticipated men's UCI, our record attempt of the modern era. Tonight, Italy's Filippo Gano will aim to make the record his own, but uniquely in the history of the hour record, the distance he will have to beat is that of one of his own coaching staff, Britain's Dan Bigham. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Filippo Gano's attempt on the UCI hour record, timed by Tiso. My name's Jez Cox. I'm lucky enough to be sat here in the velodrome in Switzerland. Alongside me is Dr. Michael Hutchinson, the man who wrote the book on our records. No, literally, he actually did. Michael, of course, is a multiple time trial national champion, did two attempts of his own on the UCI record, and he also coached Alex Dowsett to his second attempt in November last year. Hutch, it's so good to be sat here with someone who is such a mine of information on what we're about to see in front of our very eyes. It is just brilliant to be here you know this is this is the big one this is the big attempt this is what we've been waiting for for maybe two three four seasons what can Ghana do at the R record and to be sitting up here high in the stands ready to watch it absolutely brilliant Yes, the velodrome itself has been heated up to that optimal temperature. Everything has been set. So many marginal gains have gone into the attempt that we're about to watch. The crowd is in place. They know what they're here for to push on one of the greatest endurance athletes of the modern era, Filippo Ganna, to this potential new record, or at least we should say record attempt, because there is uh, a lot to go through in the next hour, and we're glad to say you are with us. Filippo Ganna has waited years, of course, for this moment. His performances in road time trials and on the track have made him the man to break the hour record. We'll soon find out if that expectation is going to be fulfilled because now it is indeed Ghana time. <laughs> I want to try to do the hour record for my personal goal and uh, because I will like try to write the history for the for me and for the cycling. For sure I chose also this date, not for uh, a lot of points uh, but just because uh, there is three or four person I want to present uh, in this event uh, and just uh, this day can uh, come in. So I chose uh, the heat uh, also because uh, I need and uh, want uh, this better person for me here in the Velodrome. I hope uh, the first 30 minutes everyone stay to be calm because uh, if you start go more than normal in the first 30 minutes or the last 30 is a problem. The, the bike is uh, is amazing so after uh, a few minutes uh, you have the sensation, the feeling, the bike uh, flight. So it's a, it's a super good bike. If I do the record uh, I'm happy. Maybe I go to the in the holiday. I try every single effort at under four percent of my of my head, my focus for the performance. Uh, so just one meter more is perfect. <laughs> 26-year-old Filippo Ganna, born in Vabania, Piedmont in Italy, son, of course, of a former Olympic sprint canoeist, Marco Ganna. So relaxed in that video and unloading the pressure seemingly with his just a meter comment. But Hutch, there is so much more to it, the pressure that's on him and his team this evening. The thing about an R record is it's all about you. It's the Filippo Ganna show. Anyway, he comes into the building when he got here this afternoon. His, his name is all over, the, all over the arena, all the pressure right on him. Well, the uh, cutting cutting edge technology is, uh, is, of course, always at the forefront of any hour record attempt. And we'll be taking you this evening behind the scenes so you can see more of the meticulous preparations that have gone into this event. And let's start, why not, of course, with the Pinarello bike that Ghana is riding. And the most amazing thing about it, Hutch, is that it's the first high-performance 3D printed bike ever built. So Pinarello for, for the hour record uh, has made a completely new bike, a uh, really, really big effort from uh, both from the design team and from Pinarello to deliver it. Uh, it's, it's a completely new technology, so <laughs> I think Pinarello has, has really worked wonders to, to be able to deliver this type of bike. They had to develop a new technology to, to make it possible, uh, and, and that has been sort of 
I think has felt us feel really special to see the, all, all the work they have done to deliver this bike. And uh, so obviously then there is that step from the delivery, from the drawing to get it three or to get it delivered. That, that's uh, also a big step and, and what everything is, is waiting for is like how the, does the bike feel and for sure we know that it's a very fast bike. Well, as you can see, Filippo Ganna is in the house. Final preparation is going before he goes to that start gate. Hutch, the viewers at home will have seen the silvery shimmer of that unpainted frame there. When was the last time a rider broke the hour record on a metal bike? Well, I reckon the last metal bike you should break the hour record would have been Chris Boardman back in 2000 under a slightly different set of rules where he rode a very traditional looking round tubed steel bike. This is a very different animal because this is uh, this is an alloy of magnesium, aluminium and scandium and it's 3D printed in a unique fluid shape. This is an incredible machine. And don't forget folks at home as well, the UCI stipulations are such that you will be able to order yourself a bicycle just like this. The same model exactly. It has to be that way as are the UCI stipulations. And we're just watching Filippo getting clipped in on one of two bikes he has for this attempt. The crowd absolutely loving an opportunity to see Filippo Ganna. He's already been on the track, I can tell you, by the way, on his standard track endurance bike, warming up behind the Derny for about 10, 15 minutes behind his pacer, Mark Villa. He was doing that with a good sort of hour and a half to go before we settled into the velodrome here. But understandably, Filippo Ganna wanting to just take in a few laps on the apron of the velodrome here, just to get himself back into the mode of that bike. Hutch, we had a little look into the cooling chamber where he's been warming up prior to coming up here as well, didn't we? Yeah, he's been warming up in an environmental chamber under the velodrome, uh, which is kind of which is cooled um, to a below ambient temperature, so that he can warm up his muscles, switch on all the systems, whilst not getting his actual body core temperature too high. Um, and he's come up from there, and here he is just doing a little bit of a run round, show himself to the crowd, and uh, our prepar final preparations underway. Yeah, cooling has been an absolutely integral part to both uh, Dan Bigham's attempt in August and, of course, everything that's been learned from that has been fed into this attempt by Filippo Ganna this evening, right the way down to the last minutes. So we're being told that Filippo Ganna will be starting within the next two to three minutes. Of course, this is not going to be coming down to exact clock science in terms of when he starts. Uh, from the minute he does start out of that start gate, it's exactly an hour. <laughs> Even my technological numpty can tell you that. But these are the final processes he is going through. It's just so exposed sitting there on the track apron, everybody waiting for him. The one guy, one man with an hour in front of him. Um, and one of the difficult things about this is you have to say, I'm ready, I'll go now. It's not like in the World Championships where there's a schedule and the commissaire tells you to go. You have to say, I'm ready, put my bike in the gate. It's my time. We're just watching his coach, Johnny Whale, there, attaching the, uh, by the looks of it, the tacky tape, which sticks the visor to his cask helmet. We're going to be telling you a little bit more about the helmet technology as the event goes. In fact, we're going to be breaking down a lot of the marginal gains of technology that went into both this attempt and, let's not forget, Dan Bigham's attempt in August, which has fed so much information back to this one as well. Yeah, talking to the team here, they very much regarded Filippo's attempt and Dan Bigham's attempt back in August as sort of part of the same project. Dan has tested a lot of the equipment, validated a lot of their sort of simulations from the computer and out onto the track, which has, you know, freed up Filippo to do what he spends, you know, his, his core time doing, what his actual job is. Well, I can tell you, folks, that once the event is uh, underway, once Filippo Ghana has started, Hutch and I are actually going to be joined by one of his Ineos Grenadiers teammates up here. I'm not going to tell you who it is just yet. I'm going to keep you guessing, but it's a big name, and I'm sure you will enjoy his input. We're going to be drilling down into Filippo Ghana, both the man and the athlete, and finding out a little bit more about what it's like to ride in a team pursuit team with him. So there's a little clue as to who it might be. Filippo Ganna will not want to be held there too long, Hutch, will he? He's going to be wanting to get going. Hey, wait till he's ready, but he's kind of talking to his coach. We're just looking. There's a 50-second countdown, which will start at the point where Filippo tells the commissaires he's ready to go. The countdown at the start will, will, will start. Um, and that's going to be any minute now, I would think. Uh, he has Mark Villa 
who was motor pacing him just an hour and a half ago to get him warmed up just in front of him. And he is going to be doing what we call running the and line. the countdown has started. We're at 43 seconds to go now. 43, 40 seconds. Filippo Gann has been in that gate. All attempts on the UCI hour record must be from a uh, static start. So this is much the same as he would be for a pursuit. Final little adjustments at the back of his cask helmet. The crowd has gone quiet here in the Tiso Velodrome in Gretchen, and we're ready for the most hotly anticipated attempt on the UCI men's hour record of the modern era. Ten seconds now. Three, two, and one. You won't need me to tell you that the crowd here in the Tiso Velodrome in Grenchen has gone wild. Now we have exactly an hour for him to see just how far he can go. Do not forget the target. It's up on the board here above us already. And that is Dan Bigham's record of 55.548 kilometers. First lap complete. And he's already two, two seconds up on Dan Bigham, which will be further up than he was planning to be. Um, you can see the screen graphics. At the top of the screen, you've got the number of laps complete, completed and the distance that is. Bottom right of the screen, we've got the rolling clock and um, the split against, that split is against Dan Bigham's time lap by lap. You've also got an average speed, which he's going to climb through the event just because it includes that slower first lap. And at the bottom left of the screen, there is the last lap split. The average last lap split to break the record would be 16.3 seconds. So he's easing into this quite well. The second and third laps have been a lot calmer. Um, and the idea is to start off slow and build. Hutch, I can see Mark Villa down there on the, uh, the first bend, if you like, just past the start point. He's got a tablet in his hand. Can you tell us what he's doing and what he's showing Ghana there? He is showing Filippo some of what we have on the screen in front of him. He's showing him his split for the last lap, so his time on the last 250 metres. And about every five minutes, he'll give him a sign as to where he is on the overall pace. And as we can see from the graphic, the gap that he is up on Dan Bigham's time is just coming down a little bit now. He is up by 1.7 seconds at this stage. So started potentially a little hard, Hutch, but... It's hard not to. <laughs> yeah. and, and as a pursuiter, he's used to nailing it out of the gate. Um, but what he's done is he's got himself very, very quickly back under control. For him, a 16.6 second laps, which is what he's doing at the minute. That's very relaxed. That's, that's not much more than a warm-up pace just to settle into this. No, and it's worth us pointing out, we didn't really get a chance to divulge what we found out in that uh, warm-up cooling chamber, because cooling has been absolutely integral in amongst the, uh, the Ineos Grenadiers performance team here in this attempt, and also in Dan Bigham's attempt as well. Uh, we saw him come up into the velodrome still with the ice jacket on, but you and I had a lovely opportunity this afternoon to go and see Hutch in that cooling chamber and what it involved. The biggest fan I've ever seen in my life. Big, big fan, lots of aircon units and a temperature that's probably down around, what, 15 or 14 or 15 degrees? ambient temperature I mean cooling we're going to hear more about this later on um, but cooling is so important because it's quite warm in here in the village room it's about 27 degrees we want it to be warm to get the air, air pressure kind of get the air density right um, but there's also the issue about how quickly the athlete heats up you've got to keep the athlete cool because when the athlete's body temperature gets to a certain point their performance really starts to fall off. So one of the things they've really taken seriously is this issue, cooling, cooling, cooling. Here, the last couple of days, we've heard about it again and again. Well, not just you at home, but the eyes of the cycling world are on this velodrome right here this evening. And we know that many of Filippo's fellow riders are also watching and urging him on to set a new record. Hey, people. Good luck on uh, Saturday night, mate. We're all rooting for you and can't wait to see you smash it. Filippo, you know what to do. Filippo, fracca. Ciao, Filippo, good luck. We are all behind you. Ciao, Filippo. I wish you really good luck for, for your try. And uh, man, you're a machine, so go for it. Just one hour to change your life. But after 30 minutes, you have to accelerate, and then you have to fly. Good luck. 
Oh, so nice to see and hear messages, not just from his Ineos Grenadiers teammates, but also from across the peloton, and particularly Italian national team riders there. Of course, it's a big weekend in Italian cycling this weekend with Il Lombardia today, and then those inaugural Gravel World Championships in Veneto tomorrow in Italy, of course. We're here in Switzerland. If you want to share your thoughts today with us and wish him all the best, even though he won't see it until afterwards, do share them using the uh, handle at Ineos Grenadiers, and by all means, do hit up me, Jess. Cox and Dr. Michael Hutchinson next to me with your thoughts and good wishes. This attempt now, 15 laps in. How's he looking, Hutch? He's looking pretty relaxed. He seems to be, you know, feeling his way into the pace. He's planning, the whole plan with this race, this ride, was to start relatively slowly, you know, compared to the overall pace required. So, I mean, he's looking at, say, 16.2 seconds is the flat average, if you like. He's currently riding in a 16.3, 16.4s. Um, he's slightly behind Dan at this point. Uh, one, one second's behind Dan, a little bit more than slightly, actually. But the idea is to take it quite relaxed until the halfway point, and then he will go from there, depending very much how he feels. And by going slowly, you know, by going a little bit below pace into the mid part of the ride, the main aim there is actually to keep his body core temperature down by just keeping the effort under control. And that hopefully pushes back the point where his body temperature starts to rise back towards sort of an hour or 50 minutes and an hour rather than 35, 40 minutes. Yeah, some of our viewers at home will find that remarkable that he is actually using the opening laps of this attempt as the final part of his warm-up. But it makes sense when you explain it to me like that, Hutch, in terms of this is all about the avoidance of that sort of what I like to think of as the 40-minute knock. You get to that 40-minute mark, as you know only too well, and the body really starts to shut down. Yeah, I mean, an awful lot of our record attempts go wrong around about the 40-minute mark, and, and Ineos tell us that the reason for that, according to their research, is because of a, a rise in body temperature. So, so much of their planning, so much of their pacing, so much of their preparation has been to do with this body temperature issue as a main sort of physiological target, if you like. Yeah, Hutch and I had a good opportunity to sit down with their performance lead, Ben Williams, yesterday, and he explained to us that their calculations say that a 1%, uh, sorry, a 1 degree increase in core body temperature relates to a 1% efficiency drop, and that can be 15 to 20 watts for that 1% drop, and that is a lot. Yeah, and when you start adding up things like that, it's always been the the creed of this team as Sky and as Ineos of looking for what they always called marginal gains. They, they've, they've gone through a few different names for them now, but it's always the same thing. It's about looking at the details closely. Um, and this is, this is one of the keys. There's so many other things they've done. They've looked at bikes, they've looked at lubes, they've looked at tires, they've looked at tire pressures. Um, but you know, the reason for what might seem like an odd pacing strategy, you think, why would you want to go slow and have to make ground up? Why not, why not start fast and get some distance in the bank? Or why not do it on a dead even split? That's the reason for what seems slightly counterintuitive. Well, we're just going to look at his split time as he comes through here. He's now just over two seconds down on the time at this stage of Dan Bigham back in August. But don't forget, what we always need to remember is there's so much learning that will have come out of uh, Bigham's attempt. We've been very lucky to spend time with the performance team since we've been here in Switzerland. But I'm certain there's things they've not been telling us about stuff they've tweaked and really wanted to change based on Bigham's own pacing himself, I guess, Hutch. Yeah, well, they, as, as I think we said earlier, they, they've regarded the two attempts as sort of two attempts in tandem. Um, and they've, you know, they've talked about the, the Bigham Ghana project. Um, and an awful lot of stuff from Dan's attempt, not just kind of things like pacing, but things like, you know, tires, wheels, bikes, skin suits. Um, you know, they, they carry that forward into this attempt. It, it puts Dan in the very odd position that he's working very hard to help somebody break his record. Well, the, uh, he is looking very comfortable. Maybe that little bit down, but I suspect this is part of that pacing strategy. He is seeing that uh, tablet being held up by Marco Villa each time. Well, we've already seen how important the bike is in this attempt, but what the rider wears is also a critical part of the performance package. And now for nearly a year, Bioracer has been working with the team on the aero suit that Ganner is wearing this evening. And here on your screen is the story of how it was developed. With Bioracer, we initiated the collaboration about one year ago trying to implement some of the ideas that we had in order to make Filippo go, go faster. And uh, the main idea we had was to combine different type of fabrics using a base layer and a top layer. It's 
The gains are pretty large, especially because finding the right combination between the top layer and base layer allows to modify the flow around the athlete in a perfect manner. And we are fully aware there has been actually a very creating process, both from the R&D perspective, but also production perspective. A large number of samples were made, a large number of prototypes were made in order to optimize not only the aerodynamics performances, but also the comfort of the skin suit. So without them, it wouldn't have been possible. We're looking forward to Filippo Ghana World Hour attempt because uh, it's the, the pinnacle, the highlight of uh, one year testing, developing, making prototypes uh, and so on. I you earlier that we would be joined in our commentary position this evening by one of Filippo Ghana's teammates. I told you he was also a member of the Italian national team and I can tell you he's getting ready for the World Championships that start this coming week as well. Uh, he is, of course, Elia Viviani. Elia, welcome to the commentary point with us. Thanks, thanks, and hi to everyone. It's so good to have you here with us. Um, you're in this unique position of not just being Filippo's friend, but being his Ineos Grenadiers teammate, his Italian national team teammate. You've also had the, I think I'll call it the pleasure, of riding in a, a very successful team pursuit team with him. What I want to ask you, Elia, is what is it like riding on his wheel when he's really going for it in a team pursuit uh, you know it's, it's a, he is a machine so when you know when he go in front and you can recover for three laps it's something in the team pursuit you know from starting from zero 16 laps when one guy go in front and pull for three laps is the moment you say oh, okay now we can recover for three laps and then you are focusing your pool but yeah, when you have a machine like him or like Jonathan Milan, for example, it's like, uh, yeah, can, it's impossible to don't be successful sometimes. And from an Ineos Grenadiers perspective on the road, having a, an engine like him in your team, you as one of the world's foremost sprinters, it must be, he's like the golden ticket, isn't he, in terms of doing all that work to get you into position? Yeah, when you go in the meeting and you, say, you ask to people to... Stay in front from 5k to go to the last k for sure is something he can do and he look you like oh, okay it's easy i can do it so that is uh, another point so when we wear the Ineos Granadier jersey so that is what we asked to him just to bring the team in front and then uh, the guys can do a perfectly doubt for me we see so much about what he's like as a valuable member of the team but can you tell us something about filippo the man the guy what's he what, what don't we know about him behind the scenes uh, you know, I, th I think he's a leader, you know, you see when he joined, uh, when he joined the national team, it's like um, the, the other guy are, are putting all the effort together because he's there, you know, they feel the, the, they feel the pressure when he's there because they know he's one of the best riders in the world, the best time trial in the world, and then uh, you have him there with you to do in team pursuit, so th they feel that, so they follow him like a leader. And for sure, on the other side, he asked to me a lot of uh, things, like uh, when he have dubbed about, uh, I don't know, gear, like uh, I can do this, I can do that. So uh, in one side, it's a leader to follow, and the other side, he's still young, and he need to learn a lot, but so, physically, he's a machine. <laughs> and on the track, uh, yeah. it's all going okay, because we've got sort of, we're lapping at sort of 16.15, 16.2, so he's kind of holding station with his split on Dan Bigger at the minute, around about three and a half seconds. So that's kind of, that feels to me like part of the plan. Tell me, Elia. Yeah. World Championships next week. Let's let's set Filippo aside for a second. How are you? How's your preparation for the Worlds going? I'm good. I'm good. So the the last period was probably the best period of uh, my season. So I have no uh, really successful season, but I feel on the bike I'm good. So the last week I win one stage in Croatia Tour, and uh, that was also for the for the motivation for a moral really uh, a good moment to win because uh, yeah now the Worlds are coming and we as a national team for sure we step up a lot in the last few years and uh, we want to stay at this level so we feel the pressure but we think also we are ready for that how do you think Filippo is going to recover he's got four days team pursuit uh, qualies on Wednesday morning you know Filippo is a guy when if if we come out if he come out from this night really successful so there is no fatigue on his leg so he's <laughs> he's back on his super motivation and uh, the hard period for people for sure is it was the last few weeks after the world you know uh, looking back the season he have a good wins, but on the other side, he don't win the tour, he don't win the words, and 
uh, yeah, he just, I just say, rebuild your confidence for this big goal you have to the hour record. But we are quite confident if he's successful tonight, uh, if there is no fatigue in his leg for the team for Sweet 2. Elliot, final question. Um, you're a versatile rider, you're a world class sprinter, you're also a team pursuiter. You ever look at this and think, you know, I fancy having a crack at that one day? I will, I will never <laughs> try, guys. <Okay. laughs> I, my characteristic is not that, and then I see people really close, and it really is an effort. Just a few guys in the peloton can do it. So, congrats, and I just try to follow this record, enjoy it, and then uh, hopefully Filippo can do the best uh, he can do, and then we will see the results. Elia, thank you very much. Thank you. you. All the very best for those World Championships as thank well. Thank you. You get the stripy jumper. Yeah. Elia Viviani there. What a legend. Lovely to have him in the box with us. And uh, you'll be able to watch him, of course, at those World Championships in France. No doubt next week. So, Hutch, let's focus in on Filippo Ganna. Well, How's he looking? He's looking good because he's just squeezing those lap splits down, Ryan Kanda. 16-0, 16-1s. He's beginning to just haul in a little bit of a deficit. He's been running to Dan Bigham up to this point. And he's beginning to look a little kind of lighter on the bike because starting off on the kind of the lower pace, that gear looked a bit heavy. No, he's just spinning a little bit more freely. He's settling into the ride. I mean, we've already pulled back what says half a second on, on Dan Bigham and looking looking pretty controlled out of I mean, he is down. If you looked at a dead flat pace, he's seven or eight seconds down on where he would be if he was just riding a plum average. But as we know, that's not the plan. He's banging in these 16 second laps, 16 one, 16 0s, looking good. So for some of you at home, you might be wondering what kind of gear is he on? I can tell you, he's riding a 65 tooth chainring and a 14 tooth sprocket at the back. <laughs> Hutch will be able to work out exactly what kind of inch of gear that'll be within seconds, no doubt. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of... No, have, have you ever tried working it out? It's <laughs> no got chance. to be a penny farthings for crying no out loud. No I'll tell you what, it's the biggest gear anyone has ever attempted the R on that I'm aware of. Now, no is... one has beaten the R record on a bigger gear, I can tell you that. Uh, he's looking for uh, an average cadence of around about 95 RPM, and certainly, as you say, looking very light on it's it right just now. Just looking well. lighter. No, I mean, he just banged at a 15.9 there. This is, you know, what's he going to do around here? 15.8. He's really picking it up. And the whole plan, on you know, there'll, be, there'll be probably be some nervous faces in the track centre because he's beginning to really squeeze this on. And the idea was to get, you know, pretty clear through to 30 minutes before beginning to start kind of picking things up. Well, you can see how far in we are now. 16 minutes, 20, uh, 16 minutes 22 seconds into this attempt. So over a quarter of the way in. And Filippo Gana now settling into that. Now very, very familiar tuck of his. He is uh, a taller man, a broader man than Dan Bigham. Uh, a lot of talk has been since Bigham's attempt, Hutch, about how uh, Dan Bigham has almost the perfect physiological makeup and composition, the longer upper body, the short legs. What is that about? Why well, does it help? These, these guys are actually, they're part of the same project. In some ways, they're quite different. Dan Bigham's whole shtick is that he is unbelievably aerodynamic. He's worked very, very hard on his aerodynamics in the tunnel, on the track for years, and he's chased every game. But he doesn't produce that much as an engine, maybe only 340 watts for an hour, something like that. Felipe Gana, not quite as aerodynamic, partly because he's a bigger guy, partly because he, as a road pro, hasn't necessarily had the time to do what Dan has done with chasing every little game. But he's also got a much bigger engine. On the road for an hour, he could maybe do 450, 460 watts, something like that. It'll be a bit lower on the track, but you know they're very contrasting approaches. Yeah, it's very important to point that out, that um, don't for one second at home, folks, unless you're, unless you're, if you're not fully up on the history of this, think that Dan Bigham, the race engineer, has just gone out and knocked out a relatively fast one just for a bit of, you know, a bit of uh, reconnaissance. Dan Bigham is a world-class athlete. He is off to the World Championships next week to race for Great Britain for good reason. But he is employed by the Ineos Grenadiers as their race engineer. His job, particularly over the course of uh, this phase we're in now, is to help the man you're looking at right in front of you beat his own record. It's a bizarre kind of idea that you've got someone who's that good a rider and that level of a performance engineer. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like a coincidence that these two people arrive packaged in the same body, and it's a resource that, that Ineos have mined into for this, this particular evening. Well, right up to now, it's looking like a rich scene they've mined as well. This is the point early in the event where you just don't quite know because you can't, you, you can't know what the rider's feeling. You know, is he got bags of riding in him, ready to rip the, rip the lid off when he gets to half an hour? Or is he beginning to think, hmm, you know, doing our records in the past, the record I, I helped uh, Alex Dyson with last year, one of our key phrases was the first 20 minutes is for free. If the first 20 minutes isn't really easy, 
you're in a world of trouble. That's kind of, you know, because Ghana is going more slowly for the first 20 minutes, half an hour, that's a slightly different calculation. But this first 20 minutes, you just don't really know how it's going to go. It's the reading of uh, his own pacing for himself, I guess, which is different. And he'll be used to it as a pursuiter on the track. But, of course, road professionals like him are very used to looking down and seeing a head unit on their bike, which is giving them a direct readout of the watts that they're putting through their own cranks. This is an entirely different way of doing things. And although there's a tablet being used, it's wonderfully old school. It's kind of, it's, it's similar to looking at a head unit, except you're getting a much more accurate feedback, in fact. You know, and on our record attempt, there are points where you could reckon I'm five or six seconds up or I'm five or six seconds on, and that feels like a huge margin. If you were six seconds up at the intermediate split in a 50-kilometer time trial, you would think that that was nothing. And in our record, because the margins are so small and it's so critical, that can feel like an awful lot. Hutch, can you give us a little reminder, just in case people have only recently switched on, what are the numbers they're looking at on the screen right now? Right, top centre of the screen, lap 73 is the lap he's just completed, 18 and a quarter kilometres is how far he has just gone. Bottom left of the screen, it's just disappeared of course, bottom left of the screen we've got the lap split, which is how fast he did the last lap. Bottom right of the screen you've got, in the middle in the white is the current elapsed time. The 0.031 that's just flashed up, that's how far he is behind Dan Bigham for this lap when Dan did his attempt in August. That's probably going to go green this lap. I bet you that goes green this lap and the crowd will go wild. Give it a second. He has visibly picked this up. There we go. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what's happened. Above that, there's the average speed for the attempt so far. That includes the first couple of slower laps, so that will keep building and building. And again, we'll get a big cheer if and when that number goes above the current record average. The crowd are loving this. They are really warming to this point as well. It is. I mean, that's a 17, you know, 15, 7, 6, 6. It's not very long ago that would have been barking mad pace for a team pursuit, never mind anything else. This is, you know, he is going very well at the minute. It's just whether he can keep it up. Folks at home, if you want to get a sense, if you want to think about it, it, it on a big velodrome, a single rider riding around those, if you're not used to watching this, you might not quite appreciate just how fast he's going. This is the equivalent, if you wanted to keep up with him, OK, of uh, riding along uh, your local cycle path alongside a road, an urban road, a car passes you, and uh, you immediately sprint to try and keep up with that, that rider. You get up alongside them, and then you hold that for an hour. Yeah, about that. Do you want the really nerdy way to look at it? Is if you're because it's a cubic relationship between speed and aerodynamic drag. This is nerdy. I'm sorry. It means if you want to go twice as fast, you have to pedal eight times as hard, give or take. So if you were doing, let's say, 17 miles an hour thereabouts on a on a kind of a local cycle path, like if you wanted to go at the speed that Philippe is going now, you would have to pedal eight times harder than that 17 miles an hour. That's what we're looking at. It's this is a major effort. And physiologically, riders like Filippo, and particularly Filippo, are simply phenomenal. He has pressed on a lot in the last six or seven laps there, Hutch, hasn't he? I mean... He's lifted it, yeah. Yeah, he of, has. One of the things we talked about is that he is getting fairly limited information from uh, Mark Villa there, down at the bottom of the track. There is an element of him having to make his own mind up. We, one of the things we spoke to the Ineos Grenadiers performance team about was the fact that they have three different pacing strategies based on that, that Filippo knows that he can take well, on himself. But he has to make that decision, right? There's, there's one pacing strategy to half distance. And then there are three pacing yeah. strategies after that. And at half distance, at 31, 30, 31 minutes, Filippo himself makes the decision which way are we going. Are we building it? Are we going to conserve what we've got? Are we maybe going to have to pull back a little bit? Um, and that is up to him. When we said this is the Filippo Ghana shoot, you can do any amount of wind tunnel testing you like. It's this guy on the track tonight. He's got to deliver it. Um, he, he knows how to do that like nobody else, but it's all down to him. Well, it's, uh, it's been said in the, in the run-up to this event. In fact, Dan Bigham said it himself. He, I, I won't quote him directly, but it was something along the words of, I'm the, I'm the nerdy geek who's uh, done the crunch the numbers and then output the, the results of my training. And... Filippo Ganna is the flamboyant Italian who's ready to rip up the track. But actually, what we've seen of him today, Hutch, has been remarkably calm and cool under pressure, and he remains like that. It's been pretty measured, yeah, it's so, been pretty measured. Anyway, let's have a little look more closely at the components on that bike that we were looking at earlier on Ganna's bike, specifically the drivetrain and the work done by Markov, because it took an astonishing 100 hours to prepare just the chain for tonight and the lubricant being used wasn't just dripped on it was applied ultrasonically
Mockoff's biggest contribution is this, ultimately it's the two things, it's the chain, it's been optimised with their ludicrous lube, um, and also the sprockets. And to give you sort of an idea of, of where we're at, this is chain number 1420. You know, like, like, every chain's itemised and it's gone through this journey of this development and it, it's, it's a lot of chains they've done. And so a rough idea of what they're doing, it's, it's about 25 hours of work to get the chain ready for on before it gets on people's bike. Um, so that's six hours of, of initial running in where then there's the, the re-lube, the preparation, and it's run for about 14 hours on the dyno test rig um, to optimize it to make sure it is the perfect chain for people. Overall, the gains that you can find in this is it's, it's massive. It's, it's not small, it's not marginal. You know, we're looking at a 7% improvement from the chain Dan was using only a few weeks ago. The way that Muckoff have really bought into this process and it's, it's it's not a sponsorship, it's a partnership. It, it's, you know, it's a collaborative effort. You know, they, they're pushing as much as the athletes are pushing. I think that, 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 that's what's special here. And that's why he's gonna have the best tribe chain in the world. Absolutely unbelievable legs have gone to to prepare just the chain for this event, Hutch. I, as you know, and viewers at home will know, I'm a total non-nerd. I'm the anti-nerd to a certain extent. And to my mind, we've just watched a chain being dipped in a deep fat fryer with Markov branding. Am I right? No, no, you're not right. It's an <laughs> ultrasonic deep fat fryer. My apologies. Um, it's like an ultrasonic cleaner, but what it's doing is that it's getting all of the lube into all the parts of the chain, so that every part, every moving part of that chain is equally lubed. That's, that's what it's for. You can hear at home here, the crowd in here, they're cheering Pipo, they're pressing him on, and boy, is he pressing it on as well. The average speed now, 55.509 kilometers at, at, for at the this hour. rate, it's not many laps before he's going to be in front of Dan, and I, I don't know that the plan was to go out this hard, actually. Um, maybe they were just dampening down our expectations, but we are you know, gaining and gaining on the average speed that he needs to break the record. Let's put things into perspective, and this is very important. I remind you, the record he needs to beat is Dan Bickham's 55.548 kilometres for the hour. He is uh, just under, sorry, just under that. In fact, he's, uh, sorry, he is over it. 5.6 seconds quicker at this stage, but his average speed is down due to the slower start, of course. Um, Hutch, I'm going to touch on this now. I'm just going to bring it into view and start to think a little bit about it because a lot of people have spoken about this in the run-up and it's all over our social feeds as well. There are still three different hour records. We call this one the unified record. There's a lot of people out there watching that hope we get to a point where we have a, an entirely uniform record, an entirely unified F record where we don't necessarily talk about the best human effort anymore. But can you explain that to us? Why do we have these three different records? Yeah, as, as, um, as Filippo just clips over his average speed, he's just clipped over Dan's average speed for the entire event. So this is looking good. What you're talking about is the Boardman Superman record. This was the culmination of like a different branch of the tree. The R record through the 20th century got more and more technological, particularly the 1980s, 1990s. The technology started to really take over more and more. And that culminated in what is still, in spite of everything we talked about tonight, the fastest, the biggest distance anyone has done in an R, which was Chris Boardman, who in 1996 rode the Superman position with his arms stretched right out in front of a position that's now banned, rode 56.375 kilometers. And one of the things that we would love to see, I think so many people would love to see, is Filippo Ganna tonight beating that mark too. And finally, after I've had a 26 year old, 26 years of slightly odd rules in the R record, unifying that record to one record. It has to be said, and we do need to pay respect to Chris Boardman, because we're not talking about wanting to see Filippo Ganna beat Chris Boardman. It's just about unifying that record, because Boardman himself, what an unbelievable athlete, not least because he still holds that best human effort, which will now stand forever at that, at, as that record. But he also held the uh, what some people call the athlete's hour, which was the position that you actually that's, had a crack at twice. That's, that's what, they, what the UCI on road back to after they had banned the aerodynamics positions that people like Borman and Abri had used, they went back to what they called the athletes are, which was like Eddie Merckx, an old-fashioned steel track bike with dropped handlebars, and you had to do it on this kind of idea of this being a Mark I bike, and the bike would, all the bikes would be equal. It didn't really catch on, but the first rider to set that record was actually Chris Boardman, who kind of tied off that whole end of that era of the superbikes by coming back to set a fresh record to beat, literally beat Eddie Merckx's record on an old-style dropped handlebar bike. Let's not forget as well that a lot of what we're seeing, those marginal gains principles that have gone through 
the British cycling system, then Team Sky, and Ineos Grenadiers, the British team as we see it now, are underpinned by the things that Boardman was doing back then, of course, Hutch. Even that dropped handlebar bike had been milked to every possibility in terms of handlebar shape to get him as aerodynamic as possible within those rules. Chris Boardman and his coach at that time, uh, who was Peter Keane, in many ways set the template for an awful lot of this. Peter Keane went on to be the first uh, performance director of the British cycling team um, uh, that, that won medals in, in Sydney and in Athens and very much set the track that British cycling then followed under Dave Brailsford and that in many respects has led us to here. You can trace it all back to Chris Borman and to Peter Keane. Hutch, we're getting closer to 10 seconds up here at the moment. We're seeing an awful lot of green. Chances are we'll see no more red. There we go. 10 big, seconds big inside green. now. I mean, we're like 15 sixes, 15 sevens. This is very, very fast. Um, so it's 50, very, very quick. 55.692. At this stage, it's watching. It's looking like you're going to be watching a remarkable evening, folks. Do not go anywhere at home I mean, right, because the crowd right here is loving the, it. Uh, right now, on the track, he's riding at basically 57 kilometres an hour. If you look at the actual lap splits, he's riding 56, 57. Um, if he keeps going at this speed, never mind the fact that we're just closing up on half an hour. If he's going to get to half an hour and decide that it's Ghana time, heaven only knows what we might see. Well, that is the plan. Hutch, we've talked about the core temperature and, and, and all the research that's gone into this to, to ensure that that weird balance of him arriving here on track, chilled to the bone and yet warmed up and ready to go. It's remarkable. But listen, you've got to this point before in two different hour record attempts. What can happen to a rider in that time between, say, 30 and 45 minutes? What's your body going through? In general, on our record, if it's going to go wrong, it goes wrong about around about 40 minutes. That happened to me. It happened to Alex Dyson last year in November when I was coaching him, so maybe that wasn't the coincidence. When you say it goes um, wrong, just what, what is happening? What did that feel like? For me, I can only talk about what it felt like for me. Everything kind of fails. Everything becomes difficult. Above all, it becomes difficult to hold the aerodynamic position on the bike. Um, your shoulders hurt, your arms hurt, and suddenly, it, it, I mean, they call it a crisis, and it's because everything goes wrong and all at once. It's, it's, it is a horror show. This is one of the things, actually, in fact, I heard a new term used by the high-performance lead of the Ineos Grenadiers, Ben Williams, yesterday. When he talked to us, he spoke about prioritising the maintenance of position discipline in those last 20 minutes. So getting to the point that you're not overheating and therefore you're not losing those percentages. I'll give you that stat again. He said that a one degree increase in core body temperature would result in a 1% efficiency down, which could be 15 to 20 watts. But not just that, the rider starts to lose their p position discipline. And, and you're in the, you know, the position is so key. It's very, very easy. You know, when you get tired, your head starts to droop, the helmet tail goes up, or maybe your whole head goes up, or you know, something in the position that is critical goes wrong. Instantly, you lose 20, 30 watts in terms of aerodynamic drag and you gain maybe two or three watts in terms of you know, being more comfortable as you sit on the bike. I mean, this is almost like a duathlon of riding at, like I'm guessing, 440 watts or something and doing it in position. It's no good doing the 440 watts if you don't do it in the aerodynamic position. You've got to do both. Let's get a little bit nerdy with the drag then. Yeah, You talked about the, uh, the tail of that cask aero helmet going up in the air and then I, I guess it creates its own swirl behind it and swirl is what... Can you talk us through that concept, this idea that dirty air behind the rider is effectively pulling them back? Is that right? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, think of it as you know, think of putting your hand out of the car window. Uh, you know, you drive at 50 kilometres an hour, put your hand out the car window. You, you can feel not just putting a flat hand out or an edge on hand out, you can feel how different that's going to be. And it's doing that except in much, much smaller units. And what have we got here? We've got, we've got like another 15, 70, 15 seconds up. At the minute, you would have to say this: the current is all flowing Filippo's way. You would also have to say that we're now in the 32 minutes. He hasn't, he hasn't really stepped it up. If that was part of the plan, maybe he decided to pick it up earlier. It certainly looks that way. He is now nearly 16 seconds inside the time of Dan Bigham at this stage. The crowd are loving it, the Pipo Pipo chance. They're sort of building every four or five laps as well, and that is only going to increase from this point onwards. 32, 33, 33 minutes gone now. He's got to do, to break the record, he's got to do, uh, he's got to do 222 laps and 58 metres. So he's got less than 100 laps to go now to break the record. And, I mean, I wouldn't want to jinx anything for him, but certainly at the way he's going at the minute, you would have a degree of confidence that that is what we're going to see tonight here. Well, we saw in his interview that was recorded yesterday, just at the start of our broadcast, how he talked about, very calmly, talking about just needing to break the record by one metre. That is actually a rule, though, Hutch. Am I right in saying it? Well, it has to be beaten by a metre. They round it. Firstly, they round it down to the nearest metre, 
and you've got to beat it by a meter. So actually, if you're going to be picky about it, you pretty much have to beat it by two meters in order for that to work. If, if you beat, beat it by less than, if you beat it by 90 centimeters, they just round it down and you're stuffed. Well, it's, uh, it, it is worth pointing out that uh, amongst the 20, this is the 20th attempt since the, uh, the rules changed when Jens Vox set that report, uh, that record right back at the beginning of this. There have been 20 attempts, seven have been successful and 13 haven't. We must always remember that there's an awful lot of riders that have attempted this on the male side and on the women's side as well who haven't been successful. It's not an easy record, it never right. has been. Hey, listen, back to the science and understanding a little bit more about how the body temperature that we've been banging on about impacts performance. And that's been a vital part of the preparation for Ganna's hour record attempt. He has been using a core body temperature sensor and working with the company's experts to increase knowledge in this area that can be applied to top riders and amateurs as well. So in human sciences, we've been working with uh, Core, who have been helping us truly understand how core temperature affects an event like the hour record. Um, we know that if core temperature goes up by one degree, gross efficiency goes down by 1% and that could have a, that is a critical success factor for the hour. We know that at the 40 minute mark um, or around that number, um, there's a crisis point in which people can either maintain their power through to the end or they can't. Uh, and that's largely associated with, with the rising core temperature. Um, so Core have helped us really understand um, the environmental physiology required to achieve this event, both from our testing with Dan and Filippo and um, with Dan's record and now leading into Filippo's from the learning from our first attempts. So that's been really interesting for us. Um, and it's given us a really solid base from which to launch environmental physiology sciences into Filippo's programme. Uh, fascinating insight there from Ben Williams, the Ineos Grenadiers performance team lead who's been absolutely integral in the planning and the execution of this whole uh, project between Bigham and Filippo Ganna as well. Notable there, Hutch, that the sensor being used is non-invasive. It's a skin-mounted sensor which is underneath his arm. Now, you and I have both been involved in a little bit of core body temperature testing in the past, and I have to say, the sensor wasn't quite as comfortable Non-invasive would not necessarily have been how you'd have described it without <laughs> getting too graphic. No, no this is, it's, a, it's a, a skin, you know, it, it sits on the skin, it's clipped to the inside of it, like the chest, the heart rate monitor chest strap, um, and it monitors core temperature by essentially monitoring you know, the temperature of the bit of what the temperature being radiated by the body, as, as I understand that it's quite a clever piece of kit. And as a non-invasive thing, you can use it live in an attempt like this. Well, we've been told by his performance team that the target core body temperature for um, Filippo Ganna to be at, at this point, is 40 degrees. It's quite um, warm. It is. He's got the sensor on um, at the moment. It, actually, Hutch, maybe you could explain why. You and I have been in here all day preparing our notes for this attempt, and we've been taking time to get out every now and again, because it's quite warm in this velodrome. Yeah, it's why much, have they 28 degrees. It uh, it's, about? it's air density. Um, air density is the aerodynamic drag. The denser the air, the more the aero drag. So they have, what they wanted was an air density of about 1.1, 1.13 kilos per cubic meter. Um, and to do that, to try and get the air density in the right ballpark, they've kind of they've warmed the place up to about 27, 28 degrees. It's a little bit more than that. It's 1.12, a little bit more than they wanted, but that's actually got to do with the air pressure outside. And it's one of the reasons that coming here to Grenchen at 450 metres above sea level just gives you that little bit of a benefit. So he is 24, over 24 seconds inside that record set by his engineer and teammate, Britain's Dan Bigger. I've, but I've, crucially, he's into the 56s now. I've just worked out a uh, 15.8 second lap. That's what 15, 57 kilometers an hour looks like. 57 kil kilometers an hour is 15.8 seconds a lap. 58 kilometers an hour is 15.5 seconds a lap. So that lap we've just seen was closer to 58 kilometers an hour than 57. He's thundering his way towards 38 minutes. It's that 40 minute crisis point. You know, like, can he keep this up? Because he's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. We must not just expect 
uh, it to be a walk in the park. But there is a genuine shot now, folks. Those of you watching it at home and all around the world, there is a genuine possibility of the formal total unification of the UCI men's world hour record. Not heaping any more pressure on Julie. No pressure, on Philippe. Philippe. Thankfully, he can't hear me, but what a wonderful opportunity it would be to fully unify the whole thing and move on from here in a wonderful sporting moment you're watching right now. Do you know, this is one month short of being 80 years since the greatest Italian of all, Fausto Coppi, set his our record in Milan in 1942. And the way Filippo's going at the minute, he's probably going to put 10 kilometres onto the Campionissimo's record. And at the time, the, at the time Coppi's record was so good, nobody dared attack it. The idea in 1942, if you had said to them, one day an Italian called Filippo Ganna will have beating your record by 10 kilometers in his sights. Wouldn't have believed you. Well, since Jens Vox took the new unified uh, record back in 2014 in this very velodrome in Gwenchen, in fact, as uh, Hutch and I look up at the wall, we can see a picture of Jens Vox up there on his ride. Um, the gaps between them, the next one to break it in 2014 was Matthias Brandler, the Austrian, and he beat Jens Vox's record by 742 meters. Uh, not too long after that, in the spring of 2015, back here in Gwenchen, it was Rowan Dennis who bettered that mark by 639 metres. Alex Dowsett then broke it uh, at Manchester Velodrome, of all places, in 2015 by just 446 metres. I say just. It is, of course, I'd like a to remarkable... See you, I'd like to see you. I know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm giving it in the context of the, of the gaps between them. Thank you, Hutch. I wouldn't go anywhere <laughs> near this. I wouldn't go anywhere near this. And, and then there was that massive, that cavernous beating that uh, Bradley Wiggins did in the Lee Valley Velo Park uh, in 2015. He's, he's over now, point, a mile ahead. He's now basically two laps up on Dan Bigger. Right. He's got 40 minutes to go. He's two laps in front. This is quite some ride he's we're watching. Over, 40, over 58 kilometres an hour. He is just building and building and building. And we are now at that 40 minute mark that we've been talking about for the last half an hour. It's going to so go much. wrong. It goes wrong now. Yeah, do not, um, you know, don't count your chickens just yet because Jeopardy is always around the corner. There are, of course, and I can say this because he can't hear and I laugh in the face of fate, but there are all sorts of things that could happen. Um, however, the amount of planning that's gone into this, I uh, trust me, every single one of those things has been thought about. And his fan club, the uh, Pipo Gana fan club, are just beneath us and they are absolutely loving this because they know what they're witnessing right now. He has inside now 20 minutes in which to not just potentially etch his name into the history books, but chisel it in. And he's still holding a pretty reasonable line. It's not... It's not as good as it was at the start, but in a 40 minutes into an hour record, when you've got all of that upper body fatigue from holding yourself in the bike, you know, he's probably pulling about 2G in the curves at that speed. You've got twice your body weight pressing down through the bars, through your shoulders, through your elbows to actually keep that position disciplined. And we talk about it like it's an easy thing. It's not. It's really tough. Don't forget watching at home, the bike he is on right now, you'll actually be able to order in the coming weeks because that is the UCI stipulation. All the equipment you're seeing on display in front of you today, although much of it is groundbreaking, it has to be commercially available within that same year of competition as well. Hutch, one of the things we've not talked about so far is Wales. Tell me about Wales. I'm Come not back Wales. About, yes. Come back Wales. If you noticed earlier some of the video we had of the bike, the seat tube of the bike has got a row of little bumps down it. This is kind of a carryover for some research done at the University of Adelaide into Humpback Wales. Humpback Wales have bumps on them. Just, just to be clear, by the way, he's not joking. He's being no. serious here. Keep going, Hutch. Deadly on. serious. Um, and these bumps are called tubercles. Um, and they're using these on the, on the seat tube of the bike to try to keep the airflow attached because the seat tube of the bike, it's really complicated airflow because you've got two big legs going up and down. You've got everything that's in front of them in the airstream. So that's what those are, and they come from humpback whales. Well, when it comes to speed on the track, it's not just the bike, it's the rider's helmet is a critical factor. And for an hour record, it needs to push the boundaries of aerodynamics. And Cask has spent months developing the helmet and visor that Ganner is wearing this evening. Let's find out a little bit more about the work that went into making it. primary concern of a helmet is, is safety, that's a, the intent, that's obviously why helmets exist. However, over the past few years, it's obviously become more commonplace to, to design a helmet with aerodynamics in mind and time trialling and the hour record uh, are two 
disciplines that really demand the perfect aerodynamics. And everybody's different as well, everybody's body shape, their head position, their flexibility, even the skin suit they wear, they all interact with the helmet. So casks provide great, different, great solutions with having different helmets uh, to really optimize that on a rider by rider basis and a, an a, and event by event basis. And that's really what the primary focus of, of helmets has become for us in the team. The, the helmet itself is shaped around him on the outside for aerodynamic reason, but also on the inside of the helmet for comfort reason. So his head was uh, 3D scanned, and then the inside of the helmet is actually shaped so that his head could accommodate inside the helmet in the best way possible. Uh, there is also a uh, technology that was used for the very first time in this, in this specific helmet, and the contribution of cask in this process has been, again, uh, incredible, pushing really the boundaries and trying to develop something that was not done or existed before. Well, we heard from Dan Biggin there, once again demonstrating how integral his role has been in all of this, not just as the pilot rider and the one who set the record, but also in feeding back the learning and the information. I just can't think of any other time in sport, Hutch, where that's happened before, where as soon as his attempt was over and he got that Blue Ribbon event record to then go, here's all my data, and I'm going to give it to the guy who's going to beat me. You know, it's kind of traditional at an event like this for the previous holder to turn up and do a bit of glad handing, sign a few autographs and say, I wish Filippo all the best, I hope he has a great ride. It's a whole other thing to turn up with your laptop and your core body temperature sensors and all your wind tunnel data and say, right, now I have to help Filippo beat my record by as much as I can. I, I can't think of an instance like that. The subject of former record holders... I've just had a text from Chris Boardman saying he's watching this and really quite enjoying it, so... Well, Chris, as I, I hope you heard our little tribute we paid to you as well, and do enjoy the viewing, because uh, although there are many people in this velodrome around the world now with their eyes focused on this, hoping he'll take your record, of course, we must pay a massive tribute to what you have done for furthering and bettering this record over all those great years as well. Good to have you with us. I've had to do a sum I didn't expect to have to do. 59 kilometres an hour is a 15.2 second lap, and that's the territory Filippo is pulling this down into. It's 15 minutes to go. He's just building and building. We're well over 58 kilometres an hour as he laps the track. On average, we can see now his average from the start, including the slow opening laps, is 56.475. This lap is coming in at a half, 15.4. And he still looks under control. I, 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 you know, I expected a lot from a Filippo Ganna R record. This is, uh, this is, I think, more than I was expecting. I talked to Victor Campenart, who was the record holder before Dan, and Dan, and Victor said he's going to do 57 kilometres an hour minimum. And I said, "You think so, Victor?" And Victor said, "Yeah, I'm sure of it." So, I've taken a lot of soundings from a lot of people, and Victor came in top, top of the house, and Victor might be right. I tell you, that would be something absolutely remarkable. And it could be putting this record, if you can keep this up, and if you can go to 57, Hutch, we're talking about putting the record on the shelf for an awfully long time, or inspiring others who suddenly see a new frontier as being possible, and why not? You think maybe Elia Viviani was no, lying no, to us? No, I'm thinking about you coming out of retirement and harvesting. I, I, oh, you're, you're tapping away on your calculator I, there. You've got to be harvesting I all this. I tell you, Jez, I could not ride this fast if I rode <laughs> out of the back of a Hercules transport <laughs> aircraft. It this, is. Is, this is beyond, you know, I mean, you've got to understand this is very, very fast. You know, this is, you know, not very long ago this was team pursuit territory, the speeds the man's going at, and that's four guys for four minutes. This is one guy for an hour all on his own. Folks at home, wherever you are around the world, I hope you're getting a sense of what you're seeing in front of you right now because it is utterly remarkable. We're watching an absolute machine of a man who is at the currently demolishing records that have been set before him. He is already in excess of Chris Boardman's best human effort. The record that Chris Boardman holds is called the best human effort. It's called that because it's not expected to be beaten. But this evening, we believe we are on the precipice of seeing exactly that happen right here in Gretchen. It is it's a phenomenal record. I mean, he's still under control. He's still riding a nice line on the track. This is kind of, this is Ghana at his best. I mean, we're closing in on what we've got, 12 and a half minutes to go. The last 10 minutes is when, if he feels good, he'll really let it go because at that point, you know, he almost can't lose. He will pile everything he's got onto this to see what he can do. 
Filippo Ganna is a two-time world individual time trial champion and going right back to when he won that first title, still relatively recently in 2020, the elite men's title. This was the night, this was the record that so many people were talking about and waiting for. This year on the road hasn't been quite his best season. People have talked into the run-up to this about this not possibly, possibly not being his year. If he can keep this going, this is not just his year, but this is a defining marker in this current era of cycle sport. It will be a defining ride for him. It's a defining ride for Italian cycling. It's a defining ride for the R record. We're just watching him building and building on this. I mean, he's holding steady at the minute. Is he waiting for this last 10 minutes? Um, but at the minute, he's got a comfortable buffer. It's very, very hard to see him not breaking the record and not breaking it comfortably from here. You're absolutely right, though, Hutch. And we can see this from our viewpoint up here, just above the start-finish line, if you like, where we saw him in that starting gate some 48 minutes ago. And he is every now and again, just every couple of laps, he's pushing himself back on that saddle, showing that he is sliding forward now. And he is also, as you noted, just deviating a bit he's, from the line he's, there. He's human. I mean, we're seeing maybe a bit less of the 15-2s, the 15-3s. He's just maybe stretching out a 15-4. But anyway, he's still got very comfortable margin. He's still well over a kilometre an hour. Um, four laps ahead of the of the current record held by his performance engineer. And four laps in the R record is a long way, you know. And make no mistake about it, Dan's record was a good record. Um, you know, he beat Victor Campanarts to get it, and Victor Campanarts beat Bradley Wiggins. And you know, we're three steps on from from that. It's not an easy record, and he's making it look like an easy record. We've been talking you at home this evening through all the marginal gains, through the, the bike, the helmet, the skin suit design, all those tiny percentages and the little things that have filed down the possibilities of him being slowed down. But at the end of the day, as you watched him roll out that start gate, it is him, Filippo Ganna, who has to do this on the line. And that's what makes it even more remarkable. We still have 10 minutes to go, Hutch. We must not count our chickens until that hour is up. No, we can't, but I mean, we were inside 10 minutes. We are kind of well past the obvious crisis points. He's got a very comfortable buffer. I mean, if he's feeling a little bit overextended, you know, he can play it safe. He can slow down a little bit. He can slow down quite a lot, and he's still going to break the record because he's got, you know, 1.2 kilometers an hour average now ahead of it. Think, think about that level of a buffer. He could ride home at 16 and a half second laps. He would still do it. He's not going to want to do that. He wants to finish this like Filippo Gallo would finish it with that degree of class, finish it for the team. To some extent, he's finishing it for Dan Bigham because at this point, Dan wants him to beat him by as much as possible. Why not? Of course he does. Uh, well, it has to be said, Dan Bigham, I'm sure, will be watching this. Um, it's worth pointing out, by the way, that uh, Dan Bigham actually married another former, oh, sorry, a former our world record holder in Josh Loudon just yesterday. Just yesterday. This was kind of an epic piece of planning from Ineos Grenadiers. They've managed to get the two events to clash. Um, so, no, he's, he's not actually here um, because he's actually, he's now preparing for the World Championships because he's riding for GB on the track at the Track World Championships up against Filippo Ganna in the team pursuit on Wednesday. And would you like to be sitting at home thinking about that too? No. You know, he's made <laughs> Filippo Ganna a lot quicker so that he can race against them. Twice. Yes. Uh, our congratulations, of course, to Dan and Joss. We wish you all the very best, uh, not least for your married future, but also for these upcoming championships as well. I'm sure they're watching. And what an event they're watching. We're still under 15 fives, you know, he's, he's, he's still riding. This is 58 kilometers an hour that he's still riding at. And you, you know, we're honestly, I can't believe we're standing here talking about, oh, well, you know, he's backed it off a little bit. He's only doing 58 kilometers an hour. Um, you know, the crowd are so into this. They're just kind of just over below us and a little bit to the right. And every, there's only crowd, only seating on one side in the track. And on the far side of the track, he's not going to hear anything. On this side of the track, he's just going to get blasted by this wall of Italian noise. There it is. There it is. I have to say, folks at home, by the way, I am now, as uh, the crowd in front of us have been standing up enjoying themselves, Hutch and I are now standing up from our commentary point, really to take in and observe a human being at the absolute peak of physical condition. And um, it's also worth saying that I'm stood in Hutch, I'm stood next to someone for whom uh, a large part of his life as an author and as a coach, and uh, everything he does is built around our records. This is like Christmas, Easter, and everything all rolled into yeah, one it's for you. Like, it's like having Christmas at Wembley. It's, <laughs> it's everything. Um, I love an R record. I love watching a successful R record because an unsuccessful R record is, is, is a painful thing to see. It's a difficult, you know. 
I've even heard, I mean, I remember um, Graham Abreed talking about when Chris Boardman broke his record back in 19, 19, 1996, saying he wanted him to succeed because a failed R record is the sort of thing you don't want to have. You don't want to be, you know, you don't want to do that if you can possibly avoid it. I don't think that's our problem. No, he's covered now 50, just under 50, 53 minutes it'll need now of this hour record. And Filippo Ganna, he is wiggling around a little bit more now. He's dipped down yeah, he to is. the bottom of the track a couple of times, but the crowd are lifting him as best they can. He's been down once or twice over the track sponges. You can see the, those things on the coat dessert at the bottom of the track, the blue band. Those are just sponges. They're just designed to stop you riding inside the track because the black line at the bottom of the track, that's the datum line. That's 250 metres exactly. Um, you know... He's beginning to feel it, you can tell. He may be super gamma, but, you know, even for him, this isn't easy. He is just, it is kind of coming out a little bit. We see the times now, we're into 15.6s, 15.7s. I mean, to be honest, I think the 57 kilometres an hour we were getting excited about 10 minutes ago, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but it's still a superlative performance. Absolutely. Let's not forget what we're talking about here, and this is the remarkable thing. It's not just the bettering of Dan Bigham's mark, and I need to draw it back together again. This record we're talking about, Dan Bigham's record, is called the unified record. This is an opportunity in the next six and a half minutes, or seven minutes, I should say, six minutes, I should say, an opportunity to unify the whole thing, once we, and for good. We've been waiting for this for, you know, since, 20, since 2014, since, was that, eight years ago, since they actually changed the record rules back to use normal pursuit bikes we waited eight years for someone to come along who can unify this record make it one record and make the r record whole again if you like oh what a wonderful moment we're watching his performance team uh, down at trackside there just inside the, the velodrome uh, led by Ben Williams, roaring the crowd on, encouraging them to push things on. This is exactly what uh, Filippo Ganna asked for. In fact, the crowd, I can tell you, were briefed by Rod Ellingworth, performance director, of course, at Ineos Grenadiers, just before the event about what they wanted. The calm build at the beginning, and then absolutely unleash it in the final 20 he, minutes. He said they want, he wanted them to be their last marginal gain. He wanted the crowd to be the marginal gain, and, and the crowd, I think, have risen to that today. Ganna has also chosen the soundtrack that you might have been picking up in the background today too. A lot of his favourite tracks, but they build in a percussive nature towards the finale here. We're entering the final five minutes. Don't go anywhere at home, wherever around the world you are watching this, because you are witnessing a true sporting landmark. The final opportunity to finally unify this record once and for good. We'll never forget the wonderful Superman position that Chris Boardman used to set that incredible record that was called the best human record because it was never expected to be beaten. And yet we're watching that happening in front of our very eyes in Grenchen this evening. And I tell you what, let's have a word for Graham Abree, who was the kind of, people called him a maverick genius. I'm not sure he likes that title, but it's what he was. He was the man who had turned the R record upside down in 1993. Nobody expected him to do it, and he did. And he set off a cascade of innovation and new thinking in the sport. And we talked about a little bit about Peter Keane and Chris Borben as having been the progenitors of everything that happened with Team GB. Graham Abri was a catalyst in there as well, so let's not forget Graham on, on a night like this. Absolutely. I'm sure he is watching or will be watching and taking this in as well. Um, it's a particularly proud moment for me as a, a British commentator commentating, to mentioning the names of, of uh, Englishmen, Scotsmen, and uh, watching a British team who've come together to bring a wonderful Italian a sportsman to do what he is doing right now. He is getting ragged, Hutch, understandably. He's been up and down that blue timing line at the bottom there, and he's desperately tucking himself down. He knows the importance of maintaining he knows, position. He knows to keep position. He knows to ride the line because, you know, this is this is easy gains to make, is to try so hard to, ro to ride the line. The position and the line you ride, they feed into each other. When you get tired, your position goes, and that reduces your control over the bike. And it's such a fight now. His shoulders are burning, his arms are burning, his neck is burning, just holding that position, holding that line on the track. One minute, 15 seconds inside the what? record. It's, uh, it is unbelievable. And uh, Hutch, it's worth noting, he does keep knocking. He's knocked a few of those uh, sponge markers at the bottom of the track there. Yep, and the UCI has guys who put them back. Immediately, they are there. They're there, I guess, to, in, to uh, ensure the integrity of the, uh, the event and the recording of it as well. It is worth saying that once he's finished, there is a fair bit of scrutiny yet to go on in terms of the bike and all the rest of it. And of course, he has to go through the doping control, which you'd expect with any event of this level. 
Yeah, there will be, you know, the bike scrutineering, as you say, doping control. It takes maybe four or five minutes for them to actually finalise the distance, so there's a certain amount of housework to be done at the end of this, but clearly, less than two and a half minutes to go. He's going to smash this record. He is moving this record into a new era. He's going to break this record by, what's this going to be? It's going to be 1.3 kilometres, maybe? This is phenomenal. Touch. It's understandable there may be pros watching this who are thinking about one day having a crack at this. Remco Epnafol maybe looking at this and thinking one day I'm going to do that. I just hope that they're not watching this and being utterly crushed. I can understand why they might be, but I want this to inspire have the you, next wave. Have you seen anything crush Remco Epnafol? He's watching this going, come on, bring this on. I yeah. mean, this is, Gana is such a man for this record. He has the strength from the road. He has the skills from the track. You know, he's going to be, I think, the fifth Italian to hold this record. Some of the great names in Italian cycling, he will know all of them. He'll know Giuseppe Aldo. He'll know Fausto Coppi. He'll know Francesco Moser, the great Moser who broke the record in Mexico City in 1984. And he is going to be part of that story, part of that record, part of Italian cycling. We will at some point hear the bell being rung. In fact, I can look down and see the commissaire down there next to the bell, which is just past the point where Philip, uh, Filippo Ganna started nearly an hour ago, because we're coming into that final minute. When he enters that lap, which is going to be in the final uh, lap, the bell will be rung, and we will know a moment has come to crown a wonderful champion of our sport. And, and what happens here is, on the lap in which the hour will expire, the commissaire rings the bell, so Filippo knows it's his last lap. At the end of that lap, there's a gunshot and the event is over. They work out the exact distance by his average speed over the previous lap as to what he did in the second lap. So Janet, that's how they do that. He has just ripped through yet another one of the sponge markers at the bot. Oh, he's we... actually put back by Mark Villa there himself, so he knows to keep the UCI happy. We are so close to unifying this record and setting a ridiculous new marker, the likes of which we have seen all week long, Hutch, on Twitter, and we've well, kind laps, of chosen three to laps, ignore three it. Three laps more. Three laps to go. Oh, the crowd are on their feet. People have come They're down from the stands to see it. They're loving this. Oh, we're on our feet too. How could you not? How could you sit through this? I don't think there's anyone in the velodrome who's, who's sitting down. Everyone is on their feet. I do hope you are enjoying this at home. Filippo Ganna is ragged. He is all over the machine. And we're hearing the bell ring. This is the final lap of an utterly groundbreaking ride. Some thought this was inevitable, but a human being still has to do it. And the human being on this occasion has done it is Filippo Ganna. It's been Ganna time all night tonight, and he's done it. He has done it. And he's not just taken the record, but he has unified what we previously called the best human effort. What on earth then have we just witnessed? That is the fastest, the furthest a man has ridden a bicycle in an hour. We've never seen that before. We've never seen anything like that before. Oh, I am loving this. What a moment. What an utter pleasure to be here, to see this man do what seemingly so many people thought he could. And, and there's just this release of joy in the velodrome because that's what everybody wanted to see. Filippo, the man in agony from the end of that effort, he can finally sit up, he can finally move, he drops onto the infield. We can see the, the team, his, his team helpers get, getting ready to come and... Ah, I'm saying he's in agony, look at this. <laughs> how cold was that? How cold, uh, how cold. I think I saw a tweet this week saying, how can a man so good looking at Filippo Ganna be so deadly on a bicycle? He's got it all. And the moment he has the rapture of everybody in this fella, Joan. Oh, dearie me. Can you imagine the flooding of joy through the body of Filippo Ganna right now? You know, and this has been a day, it's so much pressure. He was originally going to do this record in August. He wasn't happy with his form then. He pushed it back to here. All of the preparation, all of the, the work, the effort, the cost, it focuses in on one man, on one day, on one hour. Even today, he's had to wait all day to do it. Start at 8 o'clock at night to do it, to turn up, to be Filippo Gano tonight. We're going to see a wonderful moment here where he's going to be greeted by his performance team. We've already seen... Uh, ben Williams, his performance lead for this attempt. Johnny Whale is right there as well. And we all remember the voice of Johnny Whale calling out to Dan Bigham. His lap time screaming out those numbers. Not quite as uh, electronic as the tablet formation this evening. But this team have put so much into this. For the first time now, you see Ghana with his cask aero helmet off and just taking in the warm embrace of his support team who have loved this.
He gets a big hug. Mark Vida. Yeah. And let's not forget the pressure of Mark this evening. He has to stand there and get this right for an hour every lap. I've done it. It's a hellish job. So, you know, let's have a, let's have a kind word for Mark as well. Absolutely. At least he still has his voice at the end of the evening. I didn't didn't uh, particularly like the job that Johnny Whale had on Dan Bigham's attempt where he had to shout those numbers out at the end of every lap. Gana taking in all of his fan club as well. And they're here in force. This part of uh, Switzerland in Grenchen at the base of the Grenchenberg has been in rain today. It's been kind of misty and rainy here. But this velodrome is very much an Italian hotbed right now. It's Members of the it's Italian national team. in here, team. isn't it? It's very it's sunny in I here. I tell you what, it's hot in here as well yeah. now. I don't, yeah, I just look at the... the <laughs> He's given us a party this evening, hasn't he? He absolutely has. And I have to say... Oh, don't drop him. <laughs> He's got the World Championships coming up this week. <laughs> Despite all of this, Hutch, we were asking Elia Viviani about how well is he going to recover for those worlds. If you're up against Pipo Gana in the pursuit in his coming World Championships, good luck with that. Be afraid. Be very afraid. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, like, to be in, I wouldn't like to be in the team pursuit team with him. He will roll off this so confident he's done so much work um he's got this so right tonight oh i think we're going to extend and uh, enjoy these moments we do have uh, a fair few things coming up you've already seen him handed a water bottle one of the things that his performance team shared with us and you'll know about this hatch it's uh, it's it's very important to look after at this stage between now and and uh, the coming moments just to ensure that his recovery is up to speed and we're, we've got to remember, we we're still only a very short period past him being at the absolute peak of his exertion. We saw what he was like those last few laps, and it was totally ragged. He was, he was fighting it. This was kind of that was Filippo Gan on a ragged edge that we don't often see him. Um, really, really. But I mean, to be fair, he was pushing very hard at the end of the World Championships this year. He didn't quite get the result there he wanted. You know, so he has he has dug deep, very deep in the last few weeks. But he had to dig deep tonight. But this is, you know, if you break the R record, you are Superman. You can do anything. If he hadn't broken the record, he would have been being helped off his bike. He would have been supported down to a chair. He would have looked like a broken man. He has just been energized. He'll never be quite the same again because he has done this tonight in front of us. It's just been incredible. It has. My gosh, now it's happened as well. We have to take it in. I mean, the number of people I saw suggesting to us this week that he was going to break that best human effort. And we have rightly paid tributes to Chris Boardman, Graham O'Brien, Tony Romingham, Miguel Ingerain, the riders who took on the record in that period, going within the rules they were allowed to. But now we have a fully and really appropriately unified our record. And here's another scary thing. Any of us grenadiers are using this record as a test bed for preparing for time trials in the World Tour, for preparing for climbs in the World Tour. How they manage this cooling strategy, how this is a key part of how they go forward. The interventions, the timing of food, the timing of drink, the timing of pre-cooling, exactly how a warm-up works. All of this comes out of the velodrome and onto the road next year. Even... Uh even in amongst all of uh, even in amongst all of this happening, I'll bet you, Hutch, I'll bet you someone there is already downloading his data because he's been wearing that core body sensor and we've been told that actually they'll be able to download the data from that core body temperature sensor, which is on the, as you say, the under, underside of his heart rate not, monitor not, strap. I'm not going to lie to you, Dan Bigham is probably no, reading it no, right now. No, you're probably right. It's numbers, numbers being crunched. There may even be, uh, uh, maybe Dan Bigham or, or one of the other techno nerds in here looking at them going, oh, yeah, he did overdo it a little bit. That's yeah. More than we I mean, the truth of it is I look at it and think he maybe did push on a little too hard from 15 minutes to half an hour. I mean, who am I to criticise Felipe Gana? I failed to break the R record twice. He's turned up once and banged it out of the velodrome. But we could see that, though, Hutch, even to the non-geeks like myself. We could, you could see it in his cadence, in his, and it just in the way he was pressing on on the bike. It was a very, quite aggressive as well. I think we might just be about to grab a word with him. We have Hannah Troop down there who is going to uh, grab a word with the new world hour record holder. It looks like he's just readying himself as well. Um, Hannah Troop has got the microphone ready, and uh, we're just waiting for him. I think he's going to, by the looks of it, pull a new jersey on uh, over the top of that fascinating skin suit. You're getting a little bit of a view it there on your shots as well because it's a two-layered bioracer skin suit. There's the inner layer just being peeled off at this stage, and he's waiting to put on the, the jersey which has actually been on our 
uh, Bioracer model right next to the Ineos Grenadiers car in the middle. Yes, that is it. We haven't mentioned it yet. That is the Grenadier model right in the middle of our track. And Pippo Ganna just getting his short sleeve jersey, certainly a much warmer edition on. Well, they, the two layer suits are quite hot. He'll be very pleased to get out yes. of that. I'm not surprised he wanted to take it off. So now we are at the point where we can hand over to Hannah Troop down there, who is ready to interview our new record holder. Filippo, you have just broken the UCI hour record time by Tiso. That was one hell of a ride. Just tell us how you're feeling right now. Uh, just uh, thank you, everyone, because... Uh, Because I think the support uh, that you give me is, uh, is amazing. So uh, today arrive uh, at this, uh, this amazing goal is uh, fantastic for me, and I think uh, for all staff I work uh, to to a long time for uh, arrive at this uh, result. So you even managed to pass Chris Boardman's uh, record that he had. How was that something that you always had? Yeah, this morning I think just uh, to broke the record uh, to one uh, meter, but uh, in the end I say, one, don't do one uh, new wall, no? And uh, yeah, I think uh, this, uh, this result uh, is, uh, is amazing. 56 and 70, I mean. Uh, 56, 375. It's not bad. <laughs> um, at what point during, the, uh, during this attempt did you really feel that you had it, that you were going to be able to, to break the record? Uh, I think uh, next time maybe I try in another part of the season, maybe with the more uh, fresh legs and uh, we can go more high again. But uh, I think uh, this result is amazing and uh, now we think to the recovery and uh, maybe... Uh, Maybe try to celebrate all together, yeah. They say that the 40-minute mark is when it can really start to hurt during the hour record. How are you feeling around that time? No, it's not... Uh, I think uh, the cutoff is arriving in the last five minutes when... Uh, I think it's just five minutes. It's like when we do the, the torque effort in the track, but uh, no, it's completely different and uh, the legs uh, have paid a lot of the energy for, uh, for try to do the 57 and nothing, it's okay. Well, that was one heck of a ride. Congratulations, you are now the new UCI hour record holder. Thank you, everyone, thank you. Well, there we go. Um, Hutch has crunched a few numbers, worked out exactly what the kilometer improvement is. Hutch, well, According to the screens here, and I think this is now official, the record is 56.792 kilometres. That is 1.244 kilometres faster, further, than Dan Bigham went last August. That is a big, big margin. Um, you can just see in our pictures as well that uh, Filippo Ganna is now doing some interviews in Italian, understandably. And uh, it won't be too long before we're able to show you him being presented with his distance board and the TSO watch as well, which is very much an distance hour board is, is is part of the UCI requirement for this. You have to you have to have that. That is you know that that is the shot for the UCI. Yes. Is the rider with the board right now? Somebody will be peeling out little little numbers and sticking them onto that board. Well, that was a fascinating interview that Hannah Troop gave him down there as well, Hutch, because there, there, there was me trying to build up this next wave of riders who are going to take it on. And it, it turns out he might be the next one. But what's he going to do, Hutch, now after well, the point to recover for those He's worlds? got four days. Only four days. Uh, team Pursuit qualifying uh, is Wednesday. He may, of course, not ride the qualifiers for the Italian team, but I suspect he will because you'd want him on your team even for the qualies, and you need to go fast in qualies. So he's got to get himself rehydrated, fueled. He'll be out tomorrow, I would imagine, 
either round here or maybe back in Italy just for a bit of a gentle spin. He's got to get to Paris, so he's got a day's travel day in there as well. He's got to deal with, so he's got to get a spin in there. He won't do much work at all. He's not going to do any long rides between now and Wednesday, but he is going to need to get onto the track on Tuesday with the rest of the team, do a few team pursuit efforts, get dialed back into that. I mean, he's kind of used to going at the right speed now, it would seem. But he's got to sort of switch modes from a long, an hour-long effort, a solo effort, to doing those sort of two, three-lap turns on the front for team pursuit at a higher speed, higher forces, much more concentrated form of racing. It is remarkable. Everything we're talking about here, the, the, the difference between this, the hour record, and then pursuiting. The pursuit, for those of you who don't know at home, and most of you will, I'm sure, is four kilometres. Four kilometres compared to 56.792 so kilometres. It's, it's a four-minute race. It's less than a four-minute race for the team pursuit. Yeah. Um, it is a very different thing. If you think about it for kind of track and field with athletics, you're looking at going from you know, more than a 10,000-metre runner down to around about 1500 meters you know it's 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 a span it's because cycling is different it's because it's a non-weight bearing sport it's because of the inertial issues you can't really compare them but all the same you know there was a point where you would have said that there was a team pursuit or a few years ago team pursuit was different it was a punchier event there were shorter turns that was the way it was done and you would have said a team pursuiter wouldn't break the r record and here we are check here it out are. check it out don't forget of course um the women's hour record has also been beaten this year alan van dyke doing that and alan van dyke herself also a multiple world That's time another trot. big fish it is now, this year we've seen mm. the uci r record the men's and the women's hour records both beaten by the biggest riders the best riders of their generation yeah well, there we go. He's been sprayed in champagne. Prosecco? Now we, now, now we oh, Prosecco, I presume you're right. I presume you're absolutely right. That'll be testing the uh, Prosecco resistance of that short sleeve jersey. I suspect he's gone straight through it. He's absolutely soaked now. Rightly so. Serves him right for beating it by so much. He's going to enjoy it. Oh, we're going to have a problem. We're going to have a problem with the drink fight. Now, he's followed the new regulations about pointing the bottle away from himself, of course. Yes. Yeah, so we uh, talked about how important recovery <laughs> is and hydration, and here's Filippo Gana necking, necking Prosecco in the centre of the velodrome. I mean, he's clearly overjoyed <laughs> in the amount of yeah. energy he's got. You imagine he's ridden most of 57 kilometres in an hour, and he's bouncing around like an overexcited 15-year-old. I'm watching him in cleated shoes with those overcovers on as well, on a slippery floor hutch. <laughs> I mentioned there might be some jeopardy today. I didn't think it would come after the event. To, to be fair, it's a carpet. And mind you, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of drink on that because it's a carpeted <laughs> floor. So we're going to be mopping that up. This is the moment when we get to see that distance board and the uh, lovely Tiso watch, which he's going to be presented with. I do hope at the end of the season we'll also get our Tiso watches, although I suspect we won't. I think we deserve Tiso I, watches. I agree. It's very hot uh, up here. Very hot. And here is the board arriving. Uh, this is the moment. This is the ceremony. This is the gold medal around the neck of the new our world record holder, time by Tiso. And that's actually the first time we've seen him sit down, Hutch, since he was on his bicycle. Sitting down's probably not terribly comfortable. No, I'd have thought not. We could see him, didn't we, in those closing stages, really shuffling himself back. And there is that distance board. You can see it on your shot at home now. It's actually our um, UCI commissaire who's holding it up with him. So it's the, that is the formal recognition of his record. That's UCI. the medal. Yeah, that is the medal, as you say. That's the medal. But it's also a wonderful photograph to go on the Ghana man mantelpiece for years to come. The question is, though, will it be replaced by another one? Well, who? Who's going to break the R well, record? He just told us he is. You think he's going to do it he again? He said it himself. He said you maybe think he's I good. You think he can go faster? Well, I think mm, you're asking the wrong guy here, but that's what you're paid to be here for. I, 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 he said himself, maybe, and in fact, his words were maybe at a better time of year. It was something along the line, somewhere, somewhere mean, better in the season you know for what? him. Yeah. Because, you know, it's been a phenomenal ride. But coming into this, one of the things we talked about was that his form was not absolutely pinging. He was seventh in the recent mm. Worlds. Mm. He was third in the Euros, European Championships, a few weeks before that. So, you know, and it was one of the doubts. So, I mean, can you imagine a Filippo Ganna of, of mid-2020, the imperious Filippo Ganna, who went a year without losing a time trial, rolling in here with a few more gains from the team, from Dan Bigham. I mean, 57 kilometres is not out of reach. No. It's less than a lap away. No. And he is still 26 years of age, uh, <laughs> potentially still with physiological growth to go, but crucially as well, there will be, and I know the Ineos Grenadiers performance team will tell us this, but we have every reason to believe there will be learning that comes out of this evening. There will be things in where that weren't right that they can learn from, and of course those things will be kept in-house. But, uh, but chances are they'll be reapplied, reapplied at some point. And, and if he is, if he says uh, there is a more 
uh, advantageous point of the season in which to do this, well, and they apply those games. And the other thing is that we talked a little about air density earlier. The air density tonight was not perfect. When Dan Bigham made his attempt here in August, the air density there was giving him about another 200 metres. Now, you pop that 200 metres on top of there, and we're eight metres away. Well, what a lovely shot of him sitting down, taking it in, enjoying it. He's gradually drying out with the Prosecco. Um, folks at home, I really hope you've enjoyed this evening. I'm absolutely certain you have, and we certainly have. Because this evening we have been royally treated to the measuring out of the physical capacity of one of the world's greatest endurance athletes. Filippo Ganna has broken the UCI World Hour record, timed by Tiso, and not just that, he has unified it. He has now brought together Chris Boardman's best human effort and now put an end, really, to us having to talk about the best human effort because what we have just seen this evening is exactly that. Massive congratulations must go to him and the whole Ineos Grenadiers performance team. Folks at home, we do hope you've enjoyed being along for this groundbreaking ride. We certainly have. From me, Jez Cox, and from Michael Hutchinson, thank you for your company, and goodbye from Grenchen. <laughs>